Good morning, Dr. Simon. Thank you for being our guest today. You're welcome, Katie. My pleasure. Dr. Simon, PhD, is an international expert on psychological manipulation. He has appeared on national TV and radio platforms such as CNN, Fox News, and CBS 48 Hours, among many others over his illustrious career. He is a clinical psychologist and his career has, has spanned over four decades. He's been dedicated to empowering victims of character disordered individuals and also helped those psychological manipulators to turn their lives around by their development of character. Di Dr. Simon is best known for his book, In Sheep's Clothing. This book spent almost 14 years on the bestsellers list and has been translated into 12 languages. Dr. Simon has authored three other books, Character Disturbance, The Judas Syndrome, and How Did We End Up Here? His soon to be released book, The Ten Commandments of Character, I'm going to ask Dr. Simon at the end of our program to give us a sneak preview. One of the reasons that I admire Dr. Simon so much is that when clinicians are throwing up their hands and not knowing what to do with people with, with uh, narcissistic personality disorder, Dr. Simon is smiling and laughing, and there is a good reason why. Dr. Simon, let me ask you this first question. Since the early days of your professional career, you have coined the term character disorder individuals. Today, these same individuals are known as people diagnosed with narcissistic personality disorder. And I, re I realize that these terms are different for a reason. Do you operate out of a different camp, a different school of thought than traditional psychology? And do you, are the approaches and the treatments different? That's a very good question, Katie. Early on, I think it would have been fair to say that I was in a different camp from many of my colleagues, but our camps have been growing closer over the years, closer and closer. Um, I didn't really develop the term character disorder. Um, I did develop the term character disturbance because uh, what we know now and what I suspected a long time ago is that much like a lot of other disorders that we know about, uh, they exist along a spectrum of type and severity. We know this, uh, for example, with the autistic spectrum disorders very clearly now. We realize that our old uh, pigeonholes, uh, our classification scheme was inadequate to capture the whole spectrum. And that's the way it is with character dysfunction also. So not every disturbed character has a disorder. And uh, officially in our diagnostic manual, we talk about personality uh, disorders and I distinguish personality and character, um, character being that more ethical side or moral side of our personality. So you can have a personality disorder and not be character disturbed, um, but uh, character disturbed and disordered individuals are very unique with respect to how we have to intervene with them because the problem has to do with their inadequate um, conscience formation, their inadequate moral compass, uh, the ways they tend to manipulate 
abuse or exploit uh, people. And so uh, the whole ball game changes, so to speak, with regard not only to assessing these folks, but intervening with them. The traditional approaches are pretty much not worth very much uh, when it comes to these folks. And on the tails of that comment, thank you, Dr. Simon, I would correct myself for saying the disordered rather than the disturbed. And I wanna say that in your books and on your videos, you report that you've had consistently over the years, a pretty good success rate with these individuals. When today, um, today they report, research reports, a one, about a 1% consistent rate of change among these individuals using traditional psych psychology uh, approaches. Well, the, the, the research is not incorrect about the outcomes. But one of the prime reasons the research is not incorrect has to do with the fact that the vast majority of clinicians still try to use approaches that don't and can't work. So naturally, if your folks are going into therapy and they're being mistreated en masse, in large numbers, when you, when you do the research and you ask the question, are they getting any better? The answer has to be no, of course not. But that doesn't mean that uh, th those uh, results, those research results are at odds with what I've been saying in my work. And that's not uh, in any way, does not in any way contradict what I assert uh, in my books about the nature of intervention with disturbed characters. Now, uh, one point of clarification, this work is not easy and I do not claim a great success rate because as I mentioned before, we're talking about a spectrum of both type and severity. So when it comes to the most severe uh, disturbed characters, I don't care what kind of approach you use, even if you're using the kinds of approaches that we know can work, you're not gonna have very good success, more, more than likely. We, we haven't yet uncovered the necessary secrets to that. But when it comes to the milder disturbances, um, I, I have enjoyed a very uh, satisfying career. Um, and all it took was understanding that I just had to stop doing what doesn't work. Just stop. It's, re <laughs> it's really that simple. Um, and when you stop doing that and you begin to experiment with things that might work along the way, you learn a few things. And that's been my career. And my career has been all about learning what does work. What, what didn't work became very, very clear very early on. That was kind of a no brainer. So it still boggles my mind when I do workshops across the country and across the world, actually, it still boggles my mind why anybody would still want to use techniques that we know are worthless. Uh, when it comes to this problem. Uh, but uh, I, I know it sounds maybe a little um, harsh, but the fact is that there are many out there who just frankly don't know any better, uh, don't know any different. Um, and that's slowly changing, but in my book, it can't change fast enough because we so have you, a big problem on our hands. So you've been a bit of a pioneer and you've learned a great deal through the school of trial and error yes. over the years. Mm -hmm. And while you've been breaking ground, traditional psychologists have been following in the footsteps of their predecessors for the most part. And that gap is closing though. Yeah, the gap has been closing for a number of years. I, I mentioned in my book, Character Disturbance, that when I first started doing workshops, 
uh, people were not very happy with me. Uh, and, and there were occasions when people even walked out, very seasoned professionals who thought I was just flat out crazy. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. That doesn't happen at all anymore. Um, so as a matter of fact, just the opposite has happened. And there's a reason why the books have been bestsellers for so long. You, you mentioned a bit of some uh, outdated information about In Sheep's Clothing. That book has been a bestseller now for over 22 years and, uh, and is uh, published in, uh, in almost 30 languages. We're working on a, on a, a, a couple of uh, foreign publications that will make it 30. So it's a widespread problem. And uh, folks are eager for information and clinicians, especially. Uh, I get uh, heartwarming notes, not just from individuals who say that something in one of the books changed their life, but I also get notes from professionals who say, oh my goodness, uh, my life just got infinitely easier and my patients started getting better too when I tried this new approach uh, and uh, the oftentimes have clients read the material and um, use some of the techniques and that's very edifying. So things have really changed in the, in, over the years. Well, that's got to be very gratifying to have stuck in there, to have hung in there, even when people were leaving and no just to know in your heart of hearts that you had something that was working and could be improved upon. Well, I, um, I'm, I'm a lover of humanity and people can neither help the circumstances under which they were raised, nor did they have a choice about their innate biological predispositions? We know now, and I suspected very early on, that there were many more biologically based contributions to these disturbances than we previously were uh, willing to acknowledge. There was a huge bias in our research uh, largely, I think, stemming from the dominance of learning theory, theory in the 50s, uh, where we really believed that our environment conditions everything. Uh, and therefore, if we could help people deal with the uh, dysfunctional aspects of their formative experience, uh, we could help make things better. But biological contributions play a big role uh, and a person can't help those either. And like I said, I'm a lover of humanity. So I wasn't willing to say, okay, so you've got these innate predispositions and you have this history and this is the way you function. And I'm sorry, I've got nothing for you. I wasn't willing to say that anybody it's it's not a uh, it's not even a conundrum it's not even an issue when you're talking with somebody who's hurting and who's desperate and who just needs an ear uh, mm -hmm. and an understanding and em em empathetic individual to work through issues that's easy it it's supremely easy all you have to do is be a fairly decent human being uh, <laughs> with a lot of acceptance and a lot of understanding and people will do their own work when they're in that kind of shape. It's a lot more difficult to deal with the difficult and you have to have the heart for it. And you have to have uh, a level of acceptance about the yet unknown mysteries of this grand thing we call life. And you have to have some respect for it. 
uh, in order to do this work with the seriously disordered. There was a time that we wrote off the chronically mentally ill. We threw them in institutions. We abandoned mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, meaning well, we, uh, after medicating them, we gave them their freedom and then they hit the streets. I mean, just think of all the horrendous attitudes mm -hmm. that we have had, not just publicly, but professionally yes. toward mental illness. And on that, on that note, we have uh, the helping professions is indeed a, a work of love among those that have the heart for people. And, uh, but to be a seasoned clinical psychologist over with a, a four decades of experience and to still be smiling, uh, that was so surprising to me when I first saw you on, one, on another interview. And you referred to that spectrum, that, that spectrum that much of life is about being in balance finding a balance and most much of life it, it exists on a spectrum uh, more than we realize sometimes when we want to put something in black and white it's really on the spectrum and you mentioned that in one of your books i believe it was character disturbance or that um narcissist or the narcissistic spectrum starts at one end with the character disordered and the other end with the neurotic, um, are on the spectrum, are some more open to being helped? And you, you mentioned that at the beginning of this mm -hmm. program. Yep. And uh, also, um, can you give uh, tips, uh, maybe a few differences between the two on the spectrum, how open to being helped they are, sure. and some tips for our viewers that they might use at home sure, sure. with their loved ones. Yeah, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to be kind of oversimplifying here uh, just for clarity's sake. Uh, but early on in my work, um, I realized that there were two very, very different kinds, major kinds of narcissistic individuals. One type was the kind that I had been taught was the only type, and that most clinicians had been taught was the only type. Um, they presented a bravado, uh, a grandiosity, uh, overconfidence, uh, braggadocio sometimes, uh, ha haughtiness, um, but it was a front. Underneath, that's not who they were. Um, so it was a compensatory kind of thing. In short, a neurotic kind of thing. Um, but more and more frequently, I was seeing a different kind of narcissist who wasn't putting on a front, who really did think they were all that, and who were almost unshakable in their grandiose opinion of themselves. And they lacked empathy for others. They didn't hesitate to be cruel and exploitative and abusive. Sometimes they kept it under cover, but that didn't mean that they were unaware or that they were compensating for anything. And I, in my work, I knew that there were many more of that type of narcissist than the other type. And so because we didn't have names for them then, and we didn't have the research to back me up, I called these folks the more neurotic type versus the more character disturbed type. The research has since confirmed the fact that there are indeed two major types of narcissists, very different from one another. And the research generally uses two different kinds of labels. They refer to, the research refers to the more vulnerable or compensatory type of narcissist versus the more grandiose uh, narcissist. Uh, sometimes people use the uh, 
uh, the term uh, uh, malignant narcissist to describe mm -hmm. the more grandiose types. But in any case, we now know that there are two major types. And what I think the research will confirm in time is that between those two types is a, is a vast spectrum. Uh, and uh, assessing where someone lies along that spectrum is still very much an art as opposed to a science because we just don't have a whole lot of research data yet. Um, but at least folks are looking. And at least maybe, you know, if uh, I'm pretty old now <laughs> um, and, re and semi-retired. I still love doing workshops when I can. Um, I do everything virtually now. I don't travel anymore. And I love doing consultations with individuals who want to grow. Um, and I'm working on my last book. Uh, but um, if anything, hopefully with my early work, I spurred a discussion and a renewed interest in the research. Um, and I think what we're gonna find, I'm pretty sure because I know my experience has taught me is that the spectra of disturbances is much more vast and much more complex. As a matter of fact, I, I don't know if you know this, but several years ago, the official power, the powers that be who published the official diagnostic manual that psychiatrists and psychologists and other uh, mental health professionals use to diagnose folks, they were seriously considering getting rid of the classification of narcissistic personality disorder. And there was a big blow up over that because almost anybody who's had to deal with a narcissist now <laughs> knows oh, yes. that they're out there, right? <laughs> Yes. But what we're coming to realize more and more is that our classification schemes are inadequate at best, and that narcissism itself is a feature of several personality types. It's a feature in several personality types, uh, as are other characteristics. And so human beings being who they are, being Very the complex. complex creatures that they are. Uh, really getting the assessment right is still much more of an art than a science. We have these pigeonholes and these categories to help us, but they don't tell the whole story. Um, and so um, for me, every individual is just that, an individual with their own unique biology and their own unique history and their own unique uh, resulting programming that had to do with an interaction between their biology and their environment. And um, when you intervene, you have to be mindful of all that. You have to take all that into consideration. Um, and it makes a difference. Dr. Simon, springboarding off of the comments about how complex we are as human beings. Um, the other end of that spectrum involves individuals that I don't believe many of us can wrap our minds around uh, how extreme their behavior can be. In fact, in your book, the Judas syndrome, you use some words to describe them. You said they intentionally hurt others. I'll quote from your book. They frequently and deliberately do things to exploit, hurt, and abuse others. Now, this is an extreme, granted, and we, and we don't know you know, much about them. We, we, in fact, we read about a lot of these individuals uh, all over the internet and people in relationships with them, and which is your specialty. But one of the, the things that characterize these folks 
our narcissistic rages. And they, you've said that they don't need anger management help, but, and you give anger management workshops. And, and that's a, you say that the, what motivates these folks is raw, unbridled desire. What do you mean by raw, unbridled desire and that they don't need anger management? Okay. Well, uh, you know, when I'm trying to explain this in, uh, when I try to explain this in workshops, I use a couple of analogies. Um, and, and by the way, these folks that do intentionally hurt people, we know now very solidly even though, even though I had only suspected it when I wrote my books, we know very solidly that some folks have innate empathy deficits. And we even know that their brains operate differently. Now, there's a lot of conjecture about why those brains operate differently and people can't feel, some people can't feel like most of us feel. Um, and it's too soon, way too soon to say that they're simply born that way. What we do know for sure is that some may be predisposed that way from birth. Some may have any small capacity that they have for empathy either beaten out of them or in some way cast out of them by their environment. But whatever the case may be, we do know that there are folks whose brains work very differently and they just seem to lack empathy and they actually not only wantonly and deliberately hurt people, but they do so without any compunction. It doesn't bother them. And so I use some examples about the, the what I call the, the certain kind of narcissists that fall into the category of aggressive personalities. Our traditional model of anger management is that people only aggress when they're angry and people only become angry and therefore aggress when they have something to fear. So the thinking was help them think a little differently, perceive situations differently, not be afraid not be angry, and therefore they won't aggress. But as I point out in my workshops, it doesn't always work in that direction. Anger is not always the precipitant of aggression. As a matter of fact, sometimes it's the consequent. And sometimes what drives aggression is not fear, but desire. For example, this is one of the one of the anecdotes I use in the workshops. Consider, for example, the aggressive driver. We have all seen this kind of individual. We have called them erroneously the angry driver. They don't start out angry. They just wanna get from point A to point B very quickly. It's desire and they fear entitled to get from point A to point B in the time frame that they have in mind. When do they become angry? When somebody or something is in the way. Yes. It's, so th this is my point. It starts with the aggression, not the anger. And the aggression is fueled purely by desire, not by fear. I guess you could say, they fear that that red light or that light will turn red and impede their flow. I guess you could say that, but it's really more the entitlement and the desire. Um, and so you watch them weave through lanes and, and do all of their things to get where they want to go and run those yellow lights as fast as they can and go through the red ones sometimes because they're determined to have their way and they don't care who gets hurt or who might get hurt because all that matters is that they get from point A to point B in the time they want to get there and they get ticked off 
when they encounter interference. The same thing happens in relationships. That's where I was going. So if I, if, if I was in a relationship with someone of this severity uh, disturbed, um, and they were showing a pattern of anger every time I or one of the children confronted them or across them, you're saying that these individuals want what they want and that quite often and feel there's, a cloak, there's a cloak over it of some demeanor or some impression that is really isn't who they are. Who they are underneath is a person that's determined to get their way, not more than maybe an adolescent that's never learned impulse control. Right. Yes. Or and, so, and, and, and never accepted the need for control. Never recognizing anything bigger any higher power, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, and not having a heart to subordinate one's own desires and impulses for something bigger. Mm -hmm. You see, we always thought that the only reason people fly into these narcissistic rages is because it's so threatening to their fragile self-image, that they're so unnerved mm -hmm. internally by mm -hmm. the thought that they could be defective, that it shakes them to their very foundation because after all, their self-image is a sham, is predicated on a sham. That's what we've always thought. But the reality is in our character disturbed time, that when you, when you catch these folks, when you call them out on some of their horrible behavior, they know what they've done and they know that most people would regard it as horrendous. Their rage has much more to do with control and with the assertion of dominance and with the steadfast refusal to do the work of change and growth which is what defines love. That's what defines love. I'm not talking about the sentiment of love. I'm talking about the willingness to work on behalf of anyone else, including society at large. The willingness to work on yourself to be a better person. You have to have a heart for that. But when you think you're all important and you feel entitled, that's not a very attractive prospect. And it's much easier to throw a fit, scare everybody else into submission than to subordinate yourself to something bigger. It's much easier, easier to intimidate others to step into line than it is to love. If love, real love, were easy, everyone would do it. So the fact is, hardly anybody does it because it's hard. <laughs> the, sentiment, we all... the, the sentiment is not hard. The work of love is hard. <laughs> But aren't we all a little bit on that narcissistic plane? And and we're all, it's a as you pointed out in your book, we all have a little bit of narcissism in us. We all are a little bit looking after ourselves. But then the golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them unto do unto you. And love, um, you have to love, love others as you love yourself. So there's a, a certain amount of healthy uh, self-love Right. And in order that we have to have in order to love others. Now, let me ask you this. These I, I, folks that are at the extreme end of the spectrum, do they love themselves? And 
are they capable of love? Hmm. That's a great question. But to amplify what you just said, I'll, I'll come to that question in just a second. To amplify what you said there earlier about all of us having some of that in us. The two key words are spectrum. It is a spectrum and balance, okay? There's, a, there's an issue of balance in all mental uh, health. So to get to your question, um, a lot of things in life look like love. Narcissism at its core is pathological self-love. You know, we get this, this label, narcissism, from an ancient Greek tale, right? A myth. Uh, we have trashed the meaning of the word myth. We have come to use the term myth to describe a misconception or a misunderstanding. It's not what a myth is. A myth, myth is a story that is not factually true, but contains the most timeless, most undeniable truths ever, right? So in the ancient myth, which is not factually true, but contains a powerful, timeless truth, uh, there was this hunter that was very beautiful and very skilled, and he comes upon his reflection uh, in a crystal clear pool and falls in love with his own image. Now that's important because it's the image that he falls in love with. He doesn't love himself, he loves the image. And he's got beauty and he's got talent, but these things don't come from us, they come from nature, the universe, or God, if you will. So at the core of narcissism is claiming the gift as if you were the giver, claiming the beauty, claiming the talent. And there's another aspect of the story, and that has to do with the nymph that is chasing after Narcissus, wanting his affection. But he has no time for her because he has found all he needs already in himself. So at the core of narcissism is the fact that I might have some use for you, some exploitative use, but I don't need you in the sense that most human beings need each other. So self-love, real self-love is not unhealthy. As a matter of fact, you cannot, this is a point I make in my new book, that is very near completion now. This is a point I make very strongly in it. You can't possibly love another well unless you know how to love yourself first. Narcissism is not true self-love. It's self-adoration. It's claiming as your own what's been given without any humble, regard for the giver it's very important it's not recognizing anything bigger it's not feeling the need to connect to anything bigger because you've already found everything you need in yourself that's not love that's narcissistic pathology that's grandiosity, and it borders on delusionality. It's not love. Dr. Simon, these individuals that are in relationship with innocence, um, the victims, often as you've said in, in other platforms, the victims blame themselves. They feel guilty. So out there listening to us as we dialogue over this topic, very fascinating and important topic, how can 
a partner of an individual that is purposely, intentionally exploiting or abusing them, how can they tell the difference between a disappointing or a difficult relationship where the individual is just reactive and a little bit, um, a little narcissistic, a little ornery? How do you tell the difference between somebody that is on purpose hurting them and, and taking pleasure and being sadistic and a person that um, isn't behind that mask of uh, in innocence that these individuals wear. Can you tell us how to, how to tell a difference? Yeah. And um, paradoxically, I'm going to answer the question, uh, hopefully uh, eloquently, by refusing to answer it. Oh. Because the question basically is, if I might take a liberty and paraphrase. The question is, in line with traditional psychological theory, how do I understand what's really behind this behavior? How do I understand the underpinnings of it? And my answer is, don't. Don't you dare. And don't you dare even try. Judge the behavior on its own merits and the behavior only. Some behavior is okay. Some is not. Period. End of story. Period. End of story. You'll find out. You'll find out in due course whether someone is hardwired, disordered, once you stop tolerating disrespectful, harmful, exploitive behavior, if the person has a conscience, if they have sentiments, if they have empathy, if they have the capacity for self-reflection, if you say, you know what, I'm not taking this, they will realize in an instant, that their relationship is trouble, is in trouble. And they will have perhaps some motivation to take a look at their behavior. And if there's something there making them do it that they don't fully understand, they may even have the motivation to seek help. If they're too character disordered, they won't care. So you'll find out in no time exactly what's underneath it all. Mm. If you will just stop trying to figure it out. I tell this to therapists too. They waste so much time and so much energy trying to figure it out. And then they even try to figure out, is it all that nature stuff or is it all that nurture stuff? Well, what difference does it make? because you can't undo the programming and you can't undo nature either. But you can deal with behavior. And for some folks, for some folks, modifying that behavior is a real steep uphill battle. And whether or not they have even a modicum of motivation to engage in that battle, which is what defines love, will become clearly evident as you work with them and you continually confront the behavior. I, I have to do demonstration upon demonstration, vignette after vignette when I train therapists in workshops about this, but then eventually the light bulb goes off and they say, oh my goodness. Oh, my goodness. So am I hearing you say, Dr. Simon, that according to the spectrum, the degree to which this individual is able to engage with that person from the neurotic to the character disturbed, you are saying that we can tell if they're engaging with us, they might be low end. And if they're not engaging and they're just going into rages, 
they want what they want what they want. They're self-willed, self-determined to get their way. They don't care about you and any caring behaviors. It's a game to them, is it not? Would that be, is that um, an extreme statement? Or would you say that people at the end of the spectrum are so arrogant and so proud and so self-determined that around them, the people are little more than pawns in a game? Right, yeah. Uh, I say, I have a few little rhyming phrases that I use in my workshops. One of them is, it's not that they're not aware. There isn't any behavior you can call them on that they haven't been called on a thousand times before. There isn't anything you can say to them they haven't heard a hundred times before. So it's not that they're not aware. The problem is that they don't care enough. Um, so it's not a matter of awareness, but a matter of careness. And um, I also say that it's not that they don't see. This is the mistake that folks in relationships and most especially therapists in therapeutic relationships, huge mistake. They waste time and energy trying to get folks to see. If I could only get so-and-so to see what they're doing, like they don't already see. The problem is not that they don't see. The problem is they disagree with the basic tenets of behavior that most of us think make us decent human beings which is why they make those excuses all the time, why they blame others. They see, but disagree. They want, they've want. found a way of doing things that they like and is comfortable, and they'd like to continue doing so. And I give an example about why it's so important to focus on behavior and, and not think about what's going on in somebody's head. I give an example of, um, you see, in psychology, we have known for a long time that the way we think about things, our attitudes, um, influence our behavior. So the thinking has been, if I get somebody to change their attitude, then they'll change their behavior. It doesn't work that way. And the example that I give, um, when my uh, grandson, Noah, was four years old, we uh, got him and his little sister, uh, swimming lessons. We had a pool in our backyard and uh, they would come over all the time. They loved that pool and we thought they might as well learn to swim. So one Christmas we got them swimming lessons. And uh, my uh, granddaughter, she's a little bit more tenacious naturally than my grandson, but he, when it came to, when it came to diving in the deep end, he just wasn't going to do it. In his mind, if he went into that deep water, he was not going to oh. come out. So now we made the same mistake that therapists and people in relationships make. We tried to get him to see. Have you ever tried to reason with a four-year-old? <laughs> we tried every way to let him see, you know, his sister would go in the water. She didn't die. His uncle, his, his Mimi, his uh, grandma. She'd go in, no problem, but he was having no part of it because he knew he would be the first one. If he went in that deep water, he wasn't coming out. Mm -hmm. But what he would do is he would go into the shallow end and he would play. And uh, there were times when we would uh, horse play a little bit and he would actually enjoy it. There'd be times I'd throw him up in the air and times when he'd come down, he'd go under the water just a little bit and he'd have to learn some breath control. And then there came a time when he had learned a little breath control when he was willing to go to the middle step on the steps and jump in himself. But of course I had to be there with open arms ready to catch him just in case, right? Then there came a time when he got a little bit more comfortable with his ability to handle the water that he was willing to go to the ledge of the shallow end and jump in. And as he got more comfortable with his ability to hold his breath underwater, there were even times he didn't 
insist that I was there with open arms to catch him if he failed. And as he gained the skills, and as he changed his behavior and experienced the consequences, mm -hmm. his mentality changed. Oh, that's excellent. That's how it works. And that's what I drill into the therapist. Stop trying to make them see. Focus on the behavior and the need for its change. Focus on that and that alone and reinforce every small step and the mentality will change. Oh, wow. That is such an excellent story. Thank you for sharing that. That makes it crystal clear. Yeah. yeah. That makes it crystal clear. Um, and, and I'm sure our viewers can wrap their minds around that whole concept now that you shared that. And four-year-olds, oh my gosh, they are definitely um, a, a subject unto themselves. And what I would like to ask you is, because our time is running a little bit low here, I think we have about 10 more minutes. Uh, maybe eight minutes or so. All right. Well, um, we talk about image management, um, where these folks manage their image to others. We, we talk um, about some very interesting things such as mind games and using the two words, I forgot. Um, like if we confront them with truth, there's a common expression that I hear from others that they hear from their significant others that are in this mindset. Uh, where they intentionally forget what happened, they manage their images, their image to others. They're able to lie um, incessantly and look people straight in the eye. It's uh, they're not ready to change. They they um, they they don't deal with confrontation well. They go into rages. All this whole this whole cadre of behaviors. In your conversations with these individuals in your office, you talk about benign confrontation, mm -hmm. that this, that the role of truth is absolutely crucial right. in everything that you do to build character in these individuals. Right. And that seems to be the core of your success with um, people that aren't at that extreme end, which you were very clear, but maybe in the middle, maybe a little bit back towards the neurotic side. You use truth to these folks and they're more prone to change. Would you describe what a benign confrontation looks like? Sure. Uh, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Yeah. Uh, you, you, uh, and I'm not the first person to have said that the truth has the power to set you free. Oh, no, it was Jesus who said that. And you are a Christ follower, are you not, Dr. Simon? I am. And you uh, and, also... And a, and a serious one, I hope. I mean, I, I, mean, I do my best to style myself one uh, as a, somebody who has grown up being taught various things. My understanding, I think, uh, is a little bit more mature than when I was younger. I, I see the profound wisdom. I reflect on, on the sayings and the deeds. And uh, each time I have kind of a new awakening, I think, oh, my goodness. You know, there's more in this than I thought. So I do my best to listen and to listen up attentively and uh, uh, embrace the message as best I can. And one of the things I've learned is the power of honest confrontation, uh, benign, loving confrontation. If somebody thinks that you have an agenda, whether it be that you're put off by them or that you have a need to prove yourself or whatever, if somebody suspects that you have an agenda other than pure love, um, there's not going to be a healthy relationship there. 
But if you're coming from a loving place, in other words, if your intent is everyone's welfare, I mean everyone's welfare, that person's welfare, their partner's welfare, their children's welfare, society's welfare, if that's your intent, you can confront anything, anything. You can even say, for example, you know, I think things would be better if you didn't think so much of yourself and thought just a little bit more about somebody else or something else, bigger. You can even say, basically, I think you're pretty grandiose. It's the how. It's the how. Some things are pretty undeniable. And you'll get much less resistance. The reason they do what they do is because it's paid off. The reason they do what they do, the reason they continue to successfully impression manage others is because it works. And if they encounter a situation where it doesn't work anymore, it throws a wrench in the works. So all, all I have to do is set a different stage. <laughs> I, I, all I have to really do, it, it, it's really very straightforward, is basically set the stage for it. This is what my experience has taught me that genuine loving and genuine emotional, psychological, and spiritual health is all about. And that's what we're going to do in here. And if you have a mind for it, that's great. If you don't, well, come back when you do. So in your decision to leave a person like this, it, it, it's important to gauge where we are in our, um, is a victim we may not be healthy enough to continue to put boundaries in place. And we may need either a respite or to leave this person altogether. But what's important is to self-analyze to see where we are and draw if we're so inclined, like you do, on that higher power, that relationship with, our, with God or Jesus, as you do for power, for peace, for joy, as so reflects in your, in your persona, Dr. Simon. And I want to say thank you for this interview today. And if someone wanted to find someone to pursue them for uh, help to build character into an individual that they care about, where would they go? Do you have a list of people that you have trained? You know, long ago that proved impossible. It's I get more emails and more messages on social media asking that question than anything else. Oh, wow. uh, but that is just an imp impossible thing. Now, in some cities where I've done workshops and done advanced training, some clinicians have asked that I put their names in a file. Um, and when I get a request from a specific area, and I know that the person is still there, I, I might give uh, a name, but I can't vouch for that person or how well they have integrated the material. Um, and so toward that end, I have always done, and, you, and the information is at my, on my blog at drgeorgesimon.com, uh, uh, I do collateral case consultations as well as individual consultations. And the collateral case consultations are for therapists who think that they have a mind for, uh, uh, for doing this work. They, they want to try to do this work, but they're not sure that they have all the right equipment and tools uh, and perspective and might need a little coaching. And so I do those as well as the individual consultations. Well, thank you for that. And we will tie things up. And thank you very much for being with us today. And we will look forward to this new book when you are finished that kind of wraps up what you have focused on for over 40 years now 
the right. focus of the Ten Commandments of character right. and building character in their, into uh, disordered individuals that lack the ability to be empathetic and to love and to have a good conscience towards others. Yes. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Simon. Are there, is there any closing remark that you might want to make? No, not that I can think of. And I'm sorry that uh, my time is short, but I really enjoyed our conversation today and I hope it helps some folks. Oh, I'm sure it is. Thank you for your years of um, serving all of us, Dr. Simon. Take care. Take care. Bye now.